Hi. Yes, they are still building a psychology department, I think. So there's plenty of noise going on. But this week I thought we'd talk about something that I could have sworn we'd already talked about because it's one of those things I talk about all the time in anatomy. It's how does a blood clot from the leg get to the lung? How are these two things related? And we'll talk about the anatomy, the anatomical root, but we should also talk about how a blood clot forms, how a thrombus forms, how it becomes an embolus, how it travels, where it goes to, exactly what it does, all those, all those things. An anatomical bent, but we'll be talking about DVTs and PEs, all right? All right, should we do some words first? Thrombus. So a thrombus is a blood clot. In the case today, we're talking about forming in a blood vessel. Now, a blood clot is a very useful thing, as if we break our skin, uh, damage the tissues, our blood tries to leak out of us. So a blood clot um, and thrombus is form in the blood vessels to close off those blood vessels and stop the blood leaking out of us. A thrombus. An embolus is something floating along inside a blood vessel that may block that blood vessel. And it might be a thrombus, a blood clot, or it might be something else like fat or air. So an embolus is floating along inside a blood vessel. If that embolus then gets stuck and blocks that blood vessel, we have an embolism. If that embolism, so this blood clot is, sorry, this blood vessel is blocked by an embolism. If that blockage is a blood clot, a thrombus, then we have a thromboembolism. <laughs> Words, they're good, right? Um, if in the lower limb, in the lower limb we have veins, this model doesn't have veins. Oh, it does have some, it does have veins. I was being uh, unfair to you, model. But, um, so if we, if we go deep into the lower limb, we can see a deep vein in here. So if a thrombus forms in here, and we have, um, if we have a thrombus in a deep vein, we have a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis. And if we're talking about veins, uh, they might also get called a VTE, a venous thromboembolism. Um, so blood clots are formed by platelets and red blood vessels and lots of fibrin forming a sticky mesh that stuff sticks to and forms a blockage. That's its aim. That's how it normally works when you cut your skin. Um, but it can also occur abnormally. And there are three broad categories um, forming uh, a thrombus which, is, which get called Virchow's triad. And there are sort of three things that we think about. There is um, damage to the endothelium, that is the cells lining the inside of the blood vessel. If those cells are damaged, there's a greater risk of forming uh, an embolus abnormally. Um, if the flow of blood through a blood vessel is changed so that it is slower or it stops, or if it's very, very turbulent, maybe it's faster and slower. So turbulent flow or stasis um, can also cause a thrombus to form abnormally inside a blood vessel when you don't want one to form. And the third category covers a broad range of coagulability disorders. So if there's a mechanism by which coagulation, blood clots normally form, if those, if those processes and pathways uh, aren't working properly, then that hypercoagulability might cause a thrombus to occur when you don't want one. So we can get a thrombus to occur in blood vessels in the body, but why in the lower limb so much? In the lower limb, because as bipedal animals, our heart is so far above our feet, there's a very tall column of blood here between the foot and the heart. It's not enough for the heart to just pump blood into the lower limb and 
suck it out of the lower limb. That's not enough for this to work. Movement is really important, the movement of your legs, because these deep veins, for example, are surrounded by muscles, which are surrounded by fascia. So as you move, the muscles contract and they help squeeze the blood through the veins and out of the lower limb. Also, as you're breathing in and out and moving around, you're changing the pressures inside your thorax and your abdomen, which is helping draw blood out of the lower limb and back into the torso. So we have a number of extra mechanisms that help the flow of blood out of the lower limb back to the heart. So if you're immobile for a while, a long period, if you're not moving, you don't have those movement aided um, bits to help the flow of blood out of the lower limb. So that changes the flow, which means we're more likely to have stasis and slow flow of blood in the lower limb. One of those categories of Virchow's triad that can contribute to abnormal clot formation. Also, we've got, we've got valves in these veins, which help that column of blood just move in one direction and not sink all the way back down again. So those narrowings can cause uh, changes in flow and are sites where clots can form and that sort of thing. So it is somewhat likely for a thrombus to form inappropriately in the lower limb if you're sat on a long haul flight or if you're sat around all day watching YouTube lectures and not getting up and walking around, right? So we've talked about thrombus. We understand the word thrombosis. Uh, and we're talking about deep vein thrombosis because we have superficial veins in the lower limb just under the skin and we have deep veins deep in the lower limb surrounded by muscle. Those superficial veins can drain two deep veins through perforator veins. So if a thrombus forms in a superficial vein it's less of an issue but it can pass to a deep vein and then you're in the same situation. So if somebody has a deep vein thrombosis what are we likely to see? Well we're likely, likely to see in just one leg so you can compare one leg to the other, swelling, redness, uh, the area around the swelling and the redness, you know, where the DVT is, where the restrictive flow is, is likely to be painful. Um, you might add warm, warm to the touch, and you may see veins nearby that are like distended, stretched and hard and painful to touch because the flow of blood has been restricted by a thrombus blocking one of the veins. Next question, how does the thrombus get from here to the lungs? And the question after that is, where in the lungs does it go and what is a pulmonary embolism? Right, what can we see on this model? So here we're, we're posterior to the knee, so we're looking at a, a popliteal vein for argument's sake. So the popliteal vein will pass through the adductor hiatus, this is the gap in the adductor muscles, to the anterior thigh, and here we have the femoral vein, and the femoral vein ascends, and the femoral vein, when it passes deep to the inguinal ligament, becomes the external iliac vein. We just changed its name, it's the same blood vessel, so femoral vein, external iliac vein, as we're getting into the pelvis. So we are here. Is that our left leg? We're here. So the external iliac vein, we can see, so these are the structures within the pelvis here. They're draining their blood through the internal iliac vein and the external and internal iliac veins will meet. Oh, there, we, there it is there. It's hidden by the sigmoid colon. We can see it a little better on the other side. The external and internal iliac veins come together to become the common iliac vein, the left and right common iliac veins, deep to the arteries here, the common iliac veins come together to form the inferior vena cava and the inferior vena cava ascends um, in the posterior abdominal wall. Are you noticing a, a pattern here? These blood vessels are getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we go. So if a thrombus breaks off and becomes an embolus and floats through these blood vessels, its passage becomes easier and easier because the blood vessels are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, the liver is here and the liver is surrounding the inferior vena cava. This is a big blood vessel. So 
the embolus will fly through, float through there, no problems, and then the inferior vena cava drains into the heart. So now our embolus is in the heart. Uh, what are, where are we going to? Uh, so the inferior vena cava is going to drain blood into the right atrium, nice big space. Blood in the right atrium will pass into the right ventricle through a nice big valve, nice big space, not really likely to get clogged up in there. And then the blood from the right ventricle is gonna go up through the pulmonary trunk, this pulmonary artery here. Remember, this is just painted blue because the blood in here is poorly oxygenated because it's going to the lungs. The purpose of the lungs is to process this blood, take the carbon dioxide out, put the oxygen in to the blood. So blood going into the lungs is blue. <laughs> it's blue on this model. Uh, and then the blood will become well oxygenated and will pass out through these red blood vessels here, these pulmonary veins. All right, so the pulmonary trunk is a great big blood vessel. So our embolus isn't gonna get clogged in there. The pulmonary arteries are also pretty big, but look, we can already see what's happening here. And we can see in here, those blue blood vessels. As soon as the pulmonary arteries enter the lungs, as soon as they enter the lungs, they start branching and branching and branching and branching and branching and branching. So now the pulmonary arteries are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. This is where our embolus is going to get lodged and it's gonna become a thromboembolism. So a PE, a pulmonary embolism, could be caused by a number of different things. This is a blockage in a pulmonary artery that could be caused by a thrombus, could be caused by fat, could be caused by air. In our case today, we're talking about a thromboembolism in a pulmonary artery, but they tend to just get called PEs, pulmonary embolism, pulmonary, yeah. Anyway, so what, what do we see? Well, um, the blood that is going to the lung for processing is unable to get to the lung for processing, or some of it is, causing shortness of breath, pain, uh, rapid breathing, rapid heart rate. There may be coughing up of blood. We're thinking blood vessels are getting damaged, and the lungs getting damaged, and the blood will be less well oxygenated. So if you measure the peripheral O2, your peripheral partial pressure of O2 in the blood, then that will be decreased. This is a medical emergency. This can result in death. This needs to be identified and treated ASAP. So we have the signs and symptoms of a PE, of a pulmonary embolism, and then we also have the signs and symptoms of a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis. That's the leap you make, and this is the anatomy that describes it, and you treat your patient. How do you treat this? Well, you need to break down that blood clot so blood can get flowing again. That's if it is, has been caused by a thrombus. So you would need to use an anticoagulant or heparin. Um, those are the typical first line treatments. Anyway, the important bit's the anatomy. The important bit for me, for me is the anatomy because that's what I teach. The other bits you can get from elsewhere. But hopefully that has helped you understand the anatomy linking a deep vein thrombosis and a little bit of the, the whys and the wherefores and linking that to the lungs. That's the pathway we're thinking of. So you need to use that anatomy and think, okay, the vein is gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Then we get to the heart, blood leaves the heart. How, where is it gonna leave the heart? You need to remember your, your, your chambers of the heart. Where does it leave the heart? And then those blood vessels are gonna get smaller, 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 clotted. And that idea of um, blood vessels being blocked by something floating around in the blood applies throughout the body. This, this, this bit also being particularly important when we're thinking about the uh, a thrombus floating around the body where it might go to. Okay, that's it. The anatomy of that stuff. <laughs> See you next week.